woke up in a lucid dream. Now we're hunting for the shards. We might be an oddball team, but at least we've got no bards. World Hello, my name is Pedro Galicia, and I'd like to welcome you to World Walkers, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons actual play podcast featuring professional cartoonists. The premise of the story is that dreamers from different worlds are brought together to help restore the dreaming tree before the dreaming world dies and the waking world gives way to nightmares. Dungeons & Dragons is a role-playing game. If you haven't played one before, here's a quick overview. Players take on the roles of characters and work their way through stories told by the Game Master, which is me. Each person creates their own character, while I create the stories and worlds they play in. Before we get started, let's get to know our players. Hi, my name is Megan McKay. I'm playing Tin, who is a female forged fighter and a gunslinger. I I live in Texas, and you can find my work at doodleforfood.com and onetruedino.com. Hi, I'm Olivia Welch, and I'll be playing the character Ertleby, who is a grandma and also a gunslinger. She's a druid, but she doesn't know it. She just thinks she's really good at gardening. You can find my work at imaginquest.net. Hello, my name is Enzo. I do the comic Cheer Up Emo Kid and Dungeon Construction. You can find them at cheerupemokid.com and dungeon.construction. I'm from Canada, and I play a character named Roberto, who is a six-foot-tall man of metal who is also a ranger. Hi, my name is Jane. I draw the webcomic The Pigeon Gazette, which you can find at thepigeongazette.tumblr.com. I play Vasa, who is a human female rogue. And fun fact about me, I once punched out one of my own baby teeth to get 50 cents from the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> Follow that up, Wesley. <laughs> Damn. I can't. Um... <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just admit it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wesley Hall, and I'm not worth your time. Please just go on. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> just vomiting. Oh, Hi, my name is Wesley Hall, and I play the dwarven wizard Brummelstone Hammerstorm. I make the comic Nameless PCs, found at namelesspcs.com. Our game begins with the characters, each one from a different world, being brought together for reasons unknown. Like all good D&D games, it begins... In a tavern. Vasa, you find yourself in front of a door. It's made of rich mahogany and slides open with ease and elegance. Once you walk in, you see that you are in a respectable tavern. Various folk with forgettable faces are enjoying themselves, and as you look past them, you find the bartender. He has a ring of maroon hair making its last stand in a losing battle. He wears a blue vest with a white undershirt. It's a busy night with waiters and waitresses working overtime to keep people's mugs filled and spirits high. Floating lanterns along the edges of the wall bring the light, bring the right level of ambience to the setting. You don't know how you got here, but you know why you're here. You're here for a drink. And just as you finish that thought, the bartender raises an eyebrow and kind of welcomes you over. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick perception check of the entire tavern before mm-hmm. I take a step forward. What is, uh, go ahead and give me a roll then. All right. Uh, so just so you know, I have a plus six for perception. Nice. And a plus six, and I have a plus sixteen for passive wisdom. What do I roll for a perception check? It would just be your d twenty and then your wisdom modifier. So plus All six. All right. So let's go. It is a sixteen plus my plus six passive whatever thing. So I guess it's a twenty. Math. <laughs> yeah, twenty two. <laughs> twenty math. Um. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> uh, taking a look around, what are you looking for exactly? You don't feel like there's anything suspicious. You don't. Nothing raises an eyebrow or two. All right, I was mostly just checking to see if there's any um, any people who looked out of place, any strange shadows, anything that would cause my sort of sixth sense to tingle. The things that stick out to you, um, the floating lanterns are interesting. They're right next to the wall, as if they should be anchored in, but they're not. And then, um, like I said, the faces are just kind of forgettable. You don't really feel like you need to look at anybody to really... They just don't seem to matter to you. All right. Well, in that case, I go ahead and saunter my way to 
the bar and I clatter down the appropriate amount of coins and I nod to the bartender and say, um, whatever you recommend. He kind of nods to you and he says, uh, how you doing? Not bad, not bad. Just enjoying the night. He starts pouring you a drink, um, and then as he does that, he says, uh, so what brings you here? Your drinks. Mm. I've just, they have the excellent reputation. <laughs> All right. Um, where are you from? All around here and there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and he, he finishes your drink and then slides it over to you. And he says, you come here all by yourself? Uh, yep. I'm all grown up and take care of myself. <laughs> Just wanted a drink. He nods and uh, <clears throat> he kind of looks around and he raises an eyebrow and he says, uh, you realize this is the dream, right? I drink the beverage slowly <laughs> to process this. And I go, yeah, heard all about it. <laughs> nice place. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm saying you realize this is a dream, correct? And as he kind of finishes that sentence, the um, doors blow open, and a large, large figure walks in. They've got, like, half-plate mail, a large mace on their side, red uh, flowing uh, cape behind them. Uh, He is covered in fur because he is a bear. Walking upright, he walks past everybody, and he comes up to the bar, and he says, uh, he looks at the bartender and he says, give me a bit of mead with some honey in it. And he just plops down next to you. And uh, the bartender goes and gets his drink, brings it back over. And then the the bear looks and kind of nods to you. He looks very warm and fuzzy, but he looks like he can hold himself in a fight. And I just kind of <laughs> look at him a little bit and then I say, are you my spirit guide? <laughs> His, <laughs> his, uh, his brow furrows and he says I'm not anyone's guide and uh, the bartender walks up and he gives you a glance for a second and he looks back at the uh, the bear and he says you realize this is a dream right and the bear uh, kind of nods for a second and he looks at you and looks at the bartender and he's like whoa if this is a dream then I... and then he just kind of starts to fade away and the bartender says, that's that's the difference between you and him. And I just say, I don't know what kind of weed or herbs I had last <laughs> night, but I'm definitely going to find that individual and I'm going to kill him because this is the strangest batch I've ever ingested. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> after that, you hear the doors start to turn and uh, start to open one more time. And as you turn around, you notice that the doors... Um, they are large and wooden still, very thick, but they are covered in large turning cogs and clanking mechanisms. And the handle, where once it was just a very nice, elegant, small handle, it's a large, brass, round handle. And the doors open up, and someone walks in. Who? Uh, give me your character description, Megan. Um, I am... Er, Tin is a six-foot-tall forged uh she's silver all over with uh, a bit of rust around the edges um looks very elegant in design very sleek but um when you get a little bit closer you see there are little chips and dents here and there in her armor that um indicate that perhaps she has seen some some shit So would you say that you're, because you're kind of like, uh, a, a, for those that don't know or don't remember what the Forge look like, they're kind of like golem type figures. Would you say you look more like a suit of armor that's filled in or like a complete person? Like what was, like the, how was your build? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Uh, yes. Um, I guess I would look like a, a person, almost like a um, sci-fi robot. <laughs> All right. So um, you walk in and you take in the same scene that Vasa just did. And you look around and the bartender kind of nods to you and welcomes you over. Um, I also look around to see if there are any, um, is there, if there's anything suspicious about the room. Mm-hmm. Do you want to just use your passive perception or do you want to roll a perception like Vasa did? Uh, passive perception. What is your passive perception again? 
<laughs> I don't know. I didn't put it down. Oh, what is your uh, wisdom modifier? Uh, zero. Zero. <laughs> All right, so you have a ten. Um, I am <clears throat> not noticing a shit. <laughs> 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 um, nothing in particular stands out to you except for, I mean, the very obvious things like the floating lanterns, um, which to you and where you come from, that would be a little weird because where you come from, magic is really not in use anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so other than that, nothing yeah. else really seems uh, to stick out. Yeah, so, I mean, it does stick out to me and I just kind of... Um... <clears throat> I'm like, well, I'm here, and it doesn't look like those lamps are any danger or threat to me. So yep. I uh, make my way over <laughs> to the bar, uh, the bartender, um, potentially to start asking some questions. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> as you approach, he kind of gives you a nod. He says, how are you doing? And for uh, Vasa, for your, uh, uh, just so you know, you've never seen something like this before. You've never seen a walking golem or a like animated metallic person <laughs> it, it, that's not something that comes from uh, where you come from really because I thought we like my world was like, you know full of magics and all that stuff it is um but it's not normal so like you may uh-huh. have encountered a a golem as some kind of guardian in a vault or um, usually, uh, what you would, what you see her as is more of a golem, which is like a magically crafted, um, usually senseless entity that doesn't really have its own free will. And this one seems to be looking around and has a, a level of intelligence that you're not accustomed to. So you, I don't want to say whether or not you've ever seen one before, but they're certainly not common and they don't, mm-hmm. they don't walk like this and they don't have the weird... Um, you, you have a weapon on your back, you, right? Uh, that is correct. I am packing some heat. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I've got a, <laughs> got a Um, yeah, so she has this, uh, large, like, just this kind of weird weapon that you've never seen before. You assume it's a weapon. She carries it like a weapon but you wouldn't begin to know how it works, except for if you were to really study it, you would see part of the handle does have the same kind of trigger that maybe a crossbow would have, but the rest of it is a very uh, weird, difficult design. True. I also have a secondary weapon that's a a glaive, so... Oh, well, yep. So, yeah, just a long, like, kind of pole arm with a curved blade at the end? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And do you take a seat next to Vasa, then? Uh, I take, I take a a seat, um, like I I leave a space, like one seat between us, you know, as is customary courtesy mm-hmm. for strangers. So. So, <clears throat> yep. So you take a seat at the bar, and the bartender walks up to you, and he he does not seem phased by you at all, Tin. Um, he just qu- quickly comes over and says, um, "Are you drinking?" I. I, uh, continue to kind of look around, and I actually don't need to drink, but sometimes I like to partake, uh, so I put down however much, uh, money is necessary, and I'm like, sure. Mm-hmm. All right, what do you want? A cider? <laughs> All right, so he has to look a little bit for that. That wasn't, uh... It's not his top shelf, um, but he does eventually find some and uh, brings it to you. And he says, are you two here together? And I just say, sir, I have never seen such a being in my entire life, but I correct myself. Whoever sold me the herb last night shall not die, but instead I will incorporate him into my business, because surely we will make millions off of this. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> I... Uh... I kind of am listening to her talk about being high on stuff, and I, uh, I kind of just lean a little bit further away, and uh, I'm like, uh, no, I'm not familiar with her. <laughs> um, he just kind of nods, and then you hear the door open once more. Um, this time, the door is a set of double doors, and it looks like it was constructed by different crafters, 
with um, different tastes and different styles. The styles so varied that they may be from different time periods. Um, there's wisps of gray shadow that glide into the tavern as the doors open, and uh, they quickly dissipate once they get maybe like two or three feet away from the doors. And in walk two people. Um, can I get descriptions for Brummelstone and Roboruto? Leslie, please. Uh, Brummelstone is uh, he, he's tall for a dwarf, but lanky. Uh, he has an unkept beard, and uh, no, like other dwarfs, which are adorned with his, is very like frizzy. Uh, he wears a large, uh, what was once a blue, bright blue, brilliant wizard's jacket is obviously faded and threadbare. And if you look, you can see that it's obviously a little too big for him. You know how like when you get a jacket that's just a hair too big, and your fingers just kind of wiggle out. Um, and it looks like it's seen some damage. He has a, a beautiful big dwarven nose and uh you know his traditional um uh it's like an undercut except it's just he's gone bald around the sides and on the top he's just kept that hair what he has kept Um, he's probably speaking loudly as he enters about something probably yelling um and robert roberto is a six to man of metal man, man of metal he looks like a suit of armor that is just walking around but for some reason he's he wears leather from the waist down so he looks like a naked like a half naked metal man has a big bow strung across his back and is like has a sh- sword and a whip on his side and um he's yeah he's very tall but in contrast to other well, he's very um, lanky and skinny for a robot. He's so he's tall, but he's kind of lithe. Mm-hmm. And he has bright blue eyes. And he has, you look at his armor, it's like there's runes that are strewn across the corners and sides of it. Um, the magical, they kind of glow a little bit. Um, and yes, he, he walks, he's walking right next to, right next to Brummelstone. Sorry, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, no, uh, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> so when you say that you have glowing blue eyes, are they like hovering in front of like metal or do you have kind of like a, the blackness of a, like that would be uh, part of like a visor? Like is it like a helmet that kind of in the middle, in the gap, there's the blue? Um, if you get what I'm saying, kind of like a Final Fantasy Black Mage style? <laughs> Oh, um, no, actually, like, you can see his face. It's, like, all metal, but there's, okay. all, there's like, these kind of, like, ri- I guess, I don't know what they're called, rivets. Okay. Like, and then there's just, like, two glowing orbs in the middle. That's, you can't see pupils or anything. They're just glowing. Mm-hmm. But, like, so, but, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. so, um, yeah, the both of you walk in, and you're kind of already in the middle of a conversation. And just like the others, you don't know how you got here. You know you want to drink. Um, is there anything that you're doing in particular when you walk in? Uh, Brummelstone would continue up and he would just saddle up next to Tin, slightly <laughs> excitable, but, you know, trying to hide it. And he would yell at the bartender, like, an L for me and my brother. Mm-hmm. And he would look over and say, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so... For Tin, when you look over, um, the person that just walked in looks to be a forge just like you are, but the construction is completely different. It does not look like they were crafted by anyone from the flats, anyone from the Kingdom of Kadim. Um, it does not look familiar to you at all. And the same thing with uh, with you. Uh, I'm going to say your name maybe a little wrong each time. Roborto? I, I, okay, that's such a clever like play on the name. I'm like, I just want to say the other one. Um, yeah, same thing is that when you when you see um, Tin, when you see the the metallic figure at the bar, she doesn't seem to have any sort of elemental flair to her. She doesn't seem to be constructed from pieces of metal. She seems to be completely constructed as a whole piece almost. It's very confusing for you, considering where you came from. Okay. So, okay. And then, yeah, again, with uh, Vasa, none of these people look right. <laughs> the dwarves that you're familiar with are um, very short and stocky, 
and um, they almost always have a stone-like appearance. Like they don't, they're not necessarily gray, but they always have like little flecks of stone or maybe like minerals kind of underneath their fingertips, stuff like that. Whereas this person just looks completely the opposite from what you would expect to see as a dwarf. So, yeah, you guys, you guys get your ales. Um, um, sit down. Or Roberto would actually also ask for a glass of milk, please. <laughs> <laughs> he he looks at you. He looks at Tin, <sighs> and he goes into the back. And eventually, he comes over and he has a glass of milk, and he says, "I can't promise anything about this glass." This is <laughs> this is as good as you're gonna get, and he just pushes it forward and doesn't take your money. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank you. Um, there's a moment of awkwardness where everyone's just kind of sitting there. Um, I assume that did you are you and um, Brummelstone flanking Tin or Vasa? <laughs> like do you? I would there? just sit to the side of. Like you're sitting in the middle of them. I thought. I don't know, though. Oh, no, I was just going to the, whatever, the further right. Okay, okay. And then, are and, you... <laughs> yeah, and Brimblestone said hi to me, but I, I kind of was, like, staring at uh, Rob- Roberto, because it was almost like looking into a mirror and realizing that something is not quite right with the reflection, so I'm more, like, taken aback by by his appearance, and then I kind of shake myself, and I'm like, oh, um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good day. <laughs> Porto is pretty much thinking the same thing. He's just like, I, I, I recognize this, but I recognize Tin as a forge, but not as like anyone I've ever seen before. And like you said, like the structure is like the built build is very different and everything. So I kind of not don't want to think about it right now. So mm-hmm. I take my glass of milk and I pour it into my hand, and a kitten walks out of my backpack and starts lapping it up. <laughs> What uh? What's the kitten look like? It is this gray, frazzled, really tiny, like really dirty thing. <laughs> but yes, and then it goes back in my backpack. Yeah. So at this point, I burst out laughing, <laughs> and then I lean forward and I just, I just wave the bartender over with like this kind of, like, all right, all right, and then I say, bartender, good sir, I'm starting to get the feeling that this is not my dream. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he looks at the rest of you and he says, you all know this is a dream, right? What else would it be? <laughs> <laughs> you just accept it right away. Like, yeah, confidently lying. <laughs> <laughs> I um, kind of like punch Brummelstone very lightly. <laughs> just to see, like, are we, is it a dream? Let's check. Little <laughs> <laughs> stone flies out of his chair. <laughs> I don't know that hurt. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little bit, <laughs> now, a little bit too hard. One thing that you're all, you all are fairly comfortable with this kind of idea because each of you is a lucid dreamer. Each of you usually has some sort of control or um, uh, awareness in your dreams. So yeah, this isn't too crazy, like you usually end up knowing you're in a dream and you have a certain amount of functionality in them and stuff. So yeah, that's part of why this isn't so, so weird. This is just another one of your dreams. Um, But you've never really had people who are so interactive with you like this. Like, you're pretty used to the idea that dreams kind of don't make sense and you kind of are able to put your perspective a little on it and gain some semblance of control... But you don't feel like these people, any none of you feel like the other people should be there. And certainly the, the thing that really sinks in with Brummelstone and Roberto is that you both know that you're lucid dreamers. You've never been in the same dream. Like, <laughs> So you're not sure if Brummelstone's especially vivid tonight. And Brummelstone, you're not sure why Roberto seems to be like pitch perfect. <laughs> And so it's, yeah, it, it's it's really sinking in now that something is uh, really weird. And as you all have that same kind of thought, the uh, barkeep looks at you and he says, "Don't don't worry, it's it's almost over." And as he says that, you guys can hear the door open again, 
when you turn to look at the door, the door has a, a blue lace um, kind of a stone handle, and the door is made of many small turning cogs and clinking mechanisms. Um, very intricate, very complicated, um, but also a little weathered. Like this is a, if it were a, a clock, it'd be a grandfather clock that has stood the test of time. And Maybe a door that's past its prime. Woo! <laughs> nice piece. <laughs> Good use of <laughs> microphone. <laughs> the door uh, opens softly but consistently. <laughs> and um, can you give us your description, Olivia? Uh, yes. There's a very old woman, maybe in her 80s. Uh, she's stooped over, so she reaches about five foot tall. She's wearing a shawl that is really long enough to be more like a cloak, but it, it counts as a shawl because it's covered in flowers. It's sort of like a like a musty old pink, um, and the flowers are like this horrible like burnt orange color. Um, <laughs> the old woman has this gigantic hat on, um, short gray cropped hair, but a huge hat. Um, with a big smile underneath. And when she moves, um, which she quickly does, towards the bar, uh, it's as if her whole upper body isn't moving, and it's just, like, her legs going, like... (laughs) (laughs) Kind of like Fred Flintstone bowling. Um, But she makes a beeline to the bar. Um, She's a little short for the stool, um, but she she goes for the the seat between um, the nice uh, robot girl and the the nice um, stabby uh, hate in her eyes girl um, and, and kind of like pushes herself up there and says, oh, is, is, this, is this a dream? <laughs> <laughs> if so, I'll have a shot of tequila, please. <laughs> and the bar, the bar keep nods is right away, young lady, and uh, walks on over and... Um, Ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but he, uh, brings you a shot and thinks about it for a second, comes to terms, and then gives the old lady a shot of tequila. <laughs> and walks away, well, uh, kind of goes back to cleaning his glasses. She begins sipping it gingerly, really savoring the taste of this tequila. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> sipping the tequila? Okay. Oh, my God. Mm. Any reactions from the rest of you? Oh God! Uh, I just I just cross my arms on the bar and I just say, "Grandmother, the stories you must have to tell." <laughs> oh no, mostly about my grandchildren. This is why I go for the tequila in the dreams. In real life, I'm all about the apple juice, honey. <laughs> <sighs> so, um. <clears throat> you turn around uh, as you guys are kind of nursing your drinks or downing your drinks or however you take your drinks. Um, as you turn around, you notice that the tavern is completely empty. There's no waitresses, there's no waiters, and uh, there's no patrons. It's simply you. Um, the chairs are all tucked in. Uh, it looks like it's a well kept establishment, but it does not look like it's uh, really seen a lot of activity. Uh, You also notice that there are only five uh, stools at the bar. There was never any more. It's not like they just disappeared. But now that you've all sit there, you realize there were five stools exactly at the bar. And that was it. I would... uh, Is the bartender still there? Yeah, yeah. He's cleaning glasses. Oh. What is... His deal. (laughs) Uh, I'm stroking... Jana... Wait, Jane, what's your character's name again? Oh, Vasa? Vasa. Um, I've reached out, and I'm just starting to stroke your hair um, without having asked your permission. <laughs> what is it? Lovely. Kinda, <laughs> I just kind of take it into stride, and as if it's not unusual at all, and I kind of like tip my head graciously towards her to allow her to access oh. the braid. But then I kind of comment to the room and sort of to my compatriots at the bar, and I say... I guess the party's all here. Vasa and Brummelstone, you notice that every now and then as Ertlebee shifts, um, there's also one more piece of equipment that you notice. Um, what is your particular piece of equipment that I'm referring to look like, Ertlebee? 
It's a gun. <laughs> <laughs> it's underneath the shawl, and it's kind of tucked into um, a, like a, a belt that she's tied up, sort of like right up here, right underneath. <laughs> the um, and it's just like shoved in in there. It is a serious gun. <laughs> so you're not familiar exactly with what that is, but it definitely looks like a uh, a farmable weapon. Like you get the impression that that is um it's not to be trifled with and it looks far too heavy for um this particular lady to be carrying with any kind of accuracy. <laughs> so the bartender looks around and he finally notices that everyone's gone and um he says, "Well, Looks like the boss is ready to see you now. Um, I'll be around. Go ahead and give me a, a call. I go by bartender, barkeep, sir, hey, whatever floats your boat. Um, but just give me a Can call. Can I call you, you Kevin? Yes. No. No. Let me no. wait. Wait. No. <laughs> no. Only because it's not my name. All right. Kevin's a beautiful name, though. <laughs> I wanted to name my grandchild Kevin. Instead, we had to name him <laughs> Bradley. <laughs> he says, well, sorry. He's, I'm sorry for your loss. And he walks away. <laughs> I still um, love Bradley, of course. There's nothing against Bradley, personally. <laughs> he does what he can. <laughs> um so, um, <clears throat> yeah, he walks behind the bar. There's a, a large mirror um, where you guys can take a look at yourselves. You have to, just like any other kind of dream that you've had, you really have to kind of focus at the mirror to really get your reflection. Because mirrors don't typically, in your dreams, they're not accurate. You know what I'm saying? So it really takes your, your forced perspective to bring it together. But you can see yourselves when you look. Um, but he walks kind of behind that large uh, area. And you can hear him kind of cleaning up in the back. And there is a set of stairs that you didn't notice before um, off to the right. And coming down the stairs, you see a pair of heavy leather boots followed by green weathered slacks, worn leather gloves, and a tucked-in beige button-up shirt. A cloak of midnight blue drapes the figure. And if you were to look at the fabric long enough, you would swear that you could see the hint of an open night sky on a clear autumn night. A brown goatee of a brown goatee sticks out from under the hood of the cloak, almost three inches in length. If you're looking for a face, you don't see one though. You're honestly not even sure if the figure has one, but you somehow understand that it has a scar across its face, even though you can't see it. You just have that kind of understanding. A satchel hangs over one so, uh, shoulder. As he comes down the stairs, um, he walks over to the largest table in the area, and there are five chairs set up plus his and um, he kind of motions forward and asks you to join him simply through gesture. Rumble Stone well, takes his L and joins. <laughs> More I, look, I actually offer my elbow to Ertlebe <laughs> and I gesture towards the table. You're such a <laughs> nice young oh. lady. <laughs> She's going to pickpocket you. I'm so <laughs> Yes, please lead the way, dearie. I just pat her, pat her hand on my arm, and I guide us out to the sit down there. <laughs> I uh, finish the last of my drink and just like leave the the glass at the thing and walk over to the table. Mm-hmm. Also, real quick, can I um, do a better job of describing my character? <laughs> <laughs> like, I realized there were some things that I needed to describe about her real quick. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Okay, so as as Tin stands, um, you see that she is wearing a somewhat like a skirt that allows for maximum movement of her legs, and um, keeping up the skirt is almost like a belt made of bullets. Uh, on her back seems to be some kind of um almost like a a rocket or some kind of like generator, Uh, but it is not on or functioning in any sense. So, there. Mm. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Okay, and then I sit down. 
<laughs> I take the time for everyone to further investigate. <laughs> I just turn around real slow so everyone can <laughs> Like, hey, you're like, point to your belt. Like, like, ah, don't, know, I don't know if you noticed this when I walked in, but I got <laughs> that on my back. <laughs> it's, it's a John Woo shot pre pigeon. It's just slow mo. <laughs> <laughs> Why, that dead generator is most curious indeed. <laughs> Did you notice that? What's your name again, dearie? Vasa, grandmother. Vasa, a lovely name. Such a lovely girl. Oh, well, I'm having such a lovely time sitting next to you here. <laughs> at the space we're sitting. <laughs> <laughs> turn to Brummelstone and I'm like, what's a grandmother? I, I, I kind of lay them is. off, and I just kind of whisper, like, uh, it's nothing to worry about now. Just be ready in case anything goes awry. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> all right, so you all kind of gather to the table then? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. You all sit down, and um, the person who's kind of invited you over to the table, um, kind of, the voice sounds to each of you uh, it's kind of hard to describe. It, it sounds like um, the correct voice you would expect to hear. Like the right tenor, the right level, like all the right levels, essentially. Um, almost like you can feel the voice reaching out and being the most comforting possible. Um, so that really, it, it kind of feels almost unnatural, but then you kind of come to terms with it. You, you kind of ease down. And... Um, as you all sit down, uh, the person says, thank you for coming and thank you for staying. I'm sorry I couldn't be down here right away. <clears throat> is this your dream? Uh, it's not really anyone's dream. This is kind of a um, just a meeting place for people who haven't figured out where they're going yet in their dreams. Are there snacks? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Asking we, the important question. <laughs> we we could certainly <laughs> arrange for some snacks. I could call Henry. His name's Henry? I thought Hen- it was Kevin. <laughs> mm, not the last time I checked, but... Oh, okay. Well, yes. Uh, keep talking, of course, but also get some snacks. <laughs> so, I should clear up a few things before I go on. Um, this is a little different than the dreams you're used to, I'm sure, because... Unlike the people that you saw when you walked in here, each of you shares the same ability to be cognizant in your dreams. Whereas the other people, uh, you may not know this, but when people typically understand that they're in a dream, they tend to wake up. They tend to not be able to hold on to the substance of dreams. None of you have probably had that problem because you're all cognizant when you're in your dreams, that you're in your dreams. Um, As I said before, this isn't really any one person's dream. You're all here, and you're actually here completely. Um, When I invited you here, I brought everything, not just your dreaming selves, but your waking selves as well. I don't remember being invited. (laughs) <laughs> he kind of laughs and he says, uh, well, that's that's fair to question the uh, definition of invite, I suppose. Well, um, unless you have any specific questions, uh, if you'll permit me, I- I'd like to tell you a story. And I kind of rub my nose and I say, I don't know who you are, good sir, but where I come from, we call that kidnapping. How long have we been here? Oh... Um, I'd say about five minutes if you were to wake up. Where would we wake up if we're all here? Well, um, I, I would have to send you back. <laughs> you would. And do you have that power? I do, I do. That's... Well, be quiet then. Do you have snacks? <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> he was not expecting that. He's uh, You can tell that he's not used to... Uh, Serving? He's not used to uh, <laughs> being questioned in certain ways like that. So he, he takes a step back and he kind of, you almost feel like a, a little bit more of a human side from him. And he goes, well, um, ab- absolutely. I, I'm so sorry. 
And he kind of looks around and, yeah, he gets up and he goes to the bar. He he threw him off his game a little bit. He's like, <laughs> he doesn't want to just have someone come serve you now. He's like, I'm so sorry. Uh, and he goes off to A collect. nice young man. Snaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can hear him um, and again like when he first came down the stairs you really felt like this was an entity like something something maybe a little bigger than just a person now when you hear him in the back talking with Henry he's like well what do what do we have I, we can have whatever we want that's the point Henry <laughs> like you gotta start expanding come on like <laughs> I can do it but I'm just it would be nice <laughs> if maybe you could do it next time um. <laughs> yeah. No, I know I can. Look, Henry. Henry. It sounds like there's about to be a job opening. Calm down. <laughs> You're welcome to wake up whenever you wanted to. This was your gig, not mine. I. Th- Whoa. All right. No problem. Why don't you take the rest of the night off? Um. <laughs> and you decide how long the night is because. Yeah. And then <laughs> when he comes back around, he's kind of regained his composure. And he's carrying a tray of all sorts of delectables. It's Essentially, it's everyone's favorite snacks. So it's a very large tray. He's only using one hand. And he's kind of very um, elegantly carrying it with just kind of the, the fingertips of his uh, leather gloves. And uh, he brings it before you. And you can each pick out whatever your favorite snacks are. For some somehow he knew what they were. Mmm, nuts and bolts, my favorite. <laughs> oh sweet rocks. <laughs> <laughs> what are you picking up, Vasa? I reach forward and I pick up a dry date wrapped in salted ham and I pop it in my mouth <laughs> and I go, It's perfect. Straight from home. <laughs> And I'm kind of like watching him the entire time as I'm chewing. Mm-hmm. I think Almost known has like... grabbed uh, two large uh, pieces of bread that are covered in honey. It's like <laughs> the saddest snack. He's <laughs> <laughs> going at it. Like he stopped paying attention. <laughs> and I get a cute little slice of pie. <laughs> You're just so nice. Thank you for doing this. I'm sorry to have interrupted your story. You were saying something, Kevin. <laughs> um, so he uh, he regained his composure and uh, <clears throat> clears his uh, throat a little bit and says, Long ago there was an island. It was a small island in the middle of a midnight blue ocean. If you looked into the waters long enough, you could almost see the stars themselves. This island was home to the Dreaming Tree, an expansive tree whose roots ran deep and whose branches reached to all worlds. All dreamers travel the Dreaming Tree, as it is the roots of sleep itself. Sometimes dreamers would find themselves on the island, and some dreamers would decide never to leave. In time, the island became known as Stardust. It was protected by an ancient spirit who looked over all who slept. One day, nightmares came to Stardust, formless, ever-shifting. They came to destroy and to devour. The ancient spirit was long gone. His mantle and his burdens passed down from guardian to guardian. The guardian at the time, he, he wasn't strong enough. He watched as the nightmares consumed the dreamers he promised he would keep safe. Before the nightmares could swallow the dreaming tree, Guardian shattered the island, sending the shards of stardust to different worlds. He opened his satchel and placed the dreaming tree inside. Then he fled. He scoured dreams, hiding in many different ones, until he found a sort of pocket, a, a safe place in the dreamscape that the nightmares couldn't get to. Unfortunately, this was not a permanent solution. The dreaming tree started to wither. Without stardust, its roots grew weak and its branches became tired. It started to die. Without the Dreaming Tree, the people of the world would be unable to sleep. They would close their eyes and stare at the blackness, never drifting off, never resting. Without the Dreaming Tree, sanity would break away, lives would fall apart, and eventually, the entropy that followed would rip world after world in half, leaving nothing in its wake. The Dreaming Tree must be replanted. It must be allowed to flourish once again. 
The shards of stardust must be gathered so that the island can be whole once again. And it must be done by those that can walk both the path of the worlds and the path of dreams. And so that's the story. It's, it's why you're here. And it's why you are here and no one else. Each of you is able to walk between this world and the waking world. The dangers are unimaginable and the reward is intangible. So what do you say? Will, will you help restore Stardust? When you say intangible rewards, <laughs> what, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means being immortalized in stories, and he kind of shrugs his shoulders. <laughs> it means <laughs> awareness of one's does importance. Does that pay well? Oh. <laughs> Do we get royalties on those stories? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you can feel like he's smiling, but again, you don't see a face. It's just a sensation that you have. And um, he says, <laughs> I guess I'll stop being uh, or trying to be as clever as you. No, there is no reward. I'm. There's. <laughs> there's nothing. If there is no reward, then surely there but must be no risk to life and limb, because if there is risk to life and limb, there must be a reward. That's a very good point, Vasa, dear. Thank you, Grandmother. Rumblestone would finish his bread, finally, and he said, <laughs> I'm in, and slams his hand down. Roberto just kind of looks like, oh, uh. <laughs> Yeah, he would look over and be like, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, dear, I noticed that the person in your story had a satchel, and you have a satchel. I just, I just noticed that. I just wanted to, to say, dude, it's a very nice satchel. I make suggestive eyes at you. <laughs> uh, he kind of nods and he says, "Yes, um, that's yeah. Nothing gets past you. Um, that was indeed me." Um, I am the keeper of Stardust. I am the one who's supposed to take care of dreamers. And I I failed. I did not... I did not even know that these sort of creatures, these nightmares exist. And when they came to the island, I was completely unprepared. And I did not live up to my responsibility. Oh, dear. Have some pie. <laughs> <laughs> I would pull um, a big book and ask him more about nightmares and start taking notes. He kind of nods and he says, well, I want to go back to your your question, Vasa. And again, I mean, if unfortunately anything I can give you is going to be here in the dreaming world, I I can do a lot for you, but it's just not going to help you in the waking world. And so that's why I didn't really offer anything, but if you chose to stay here in the end, it can give you essentially whatever you want, I suppose. But I assumed that that would not be enticing. Mm -hmm. How do we know that you're not a nightmare? <clears throat> well, I suppose you don't, um, but I can at least, and he kind of, he stands up and, um, he puts the satchel on the floor, and he opens it up. And the more he opens it up, the more this beautiful tree starts to unfold out of the satchel. Impossibly large. Like As he opens it up, it comes out of this small little bag and just starts to fill the entirety of the uh, tavern once it reaches above you, say, maybe six feet. So R Roberto actually has to kind of duck a little if he were standing. But the more he opens the bag, the more it just fills and fills. And when you look at the tree, it it looks like it's seen better days. Um, it's certainly beautiful. And you can see kind of the uh, tracings of uh, stars inside the branches. The branches are not translucent, but you can still almost kind of see pinpoints of light inside of them. But... Uh, it certainly does look like it's drying out. It does not look like uh, it's the healthiest it's ever been. Some of the foliage is kind of giving way. And then before too long, he just starts to close it. And he Im 
it's impossible, but he brings the tree back into the satchel. Whoa. That was just lovely. I love plants. I, I garden, you know, Vasa. Pretty robot girl. What do you think about this? Is this... <laughs> is this something you'd like to do? I, I consider it uh, an honor to be selected, and if I... Um, if I've been selected to do it, I think it's with a, a duty of mine to fulfill. That's so, very nice. I'm in. <laughs> that a girl? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the person who invited you kind of turns his gaze back to Vasa, and you can feel an eyebrow raise, even though he doesn't again show any signs of having eyebrows or a face or a body. How powerful are you? <laughs> Um, well, apparently not powerful enough, and he, <laughs> you can feel, like, he feels like a level, you, you, he's having a harder and harder time hiding how he feels, and whatever he feels, you can't help but experience as a form of expression, so he's starting to kind of become less guarded in that way, and so you can feel the, the weight of his responsibilities as he kind of opens up a little too much and then pulls back. And he says, um, I am, I am known as the King of Dreams, I'm known as the Endless Prince, I'm, I'm known by na many titles, and when it comes to the dreaming world, my powers are fairly unlimited, um, unfortunately they don't seem to be able to, uh, combat the nightmares, whatever they are, wherever they came from. Ah, a king, a prince? I would say that us going on this journey and fighting a war that you apparently cannot win on your own, that's really an unpayable debt, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, that, that actually is where that I should have started like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure that in the event of a success that you would still forever attempt to repay that debt. His... He just starts to nod, and the sensation that you get from him is almost, um, again, because he's becoming a little more unguarded, and you're experiencing what he's feeling, you kind of get the sensation of remembering what it was like to be in your position. You don't really know what that means, but that's the sensation you get, and he just, you can hear him kind of quietly chuckle to himself, and he says, absolutely. And it... You, he, he feels absolutely truthful when he says that because he hasn't pull, fully pulled himself back in yet. So when he says that, you you don't have to like roll any kind of checks or make an educated guess as to what he means. He he, You feel like he knows exactly what you're saying and he's nodding his head along with it. In that case, how can I turn down the plea of a king? But what will happen to our lives and our people while we are gone? <clears throat> like any journey, they'll have to get along without you, unfortunately. With no explanation. Or just nobody un nobody saw our disappearance, nothing is left behind. Like does time we'll be pass mistook in for real dead. Time? time time does indeed pass in real time. And unfortunately because of that, the um ability to allow you to go back and explain your disappearance is not a luxury that we can afford because the nightmares are growing stronger and they're searching. I don't think that they're going to find this place anytime soon, but it's not going to be long before they start finding other spots they need to find. And they have started to search for the shards as well. Where are the shards? Do you know? I do. Um, I know of the worlds they're on and the problem is I cannot tell you However, I have a guide who will take you from world to world. The reason I can't tell you is because if you knew and the nightmares were able to pull it out of you somehow, then the nightmares would know exactly where to go. There's only one person who knows exactly where to go, and I need you to go retrieve him. 
I speak of and I say, I cannot simply disappear without a trace. That would, the life as I knew it would be in chaos by the time of my return. Surely you can send one of your little dream minions to find one of my friends who is also a lucid dreamer and let them know of my circumstance. You know someone else who's a lucid dreamer? Surely you do. You are the all-powerful dream king. This is your realm. <laughs> right, but power doesn't equal knowledge. In order for me to know that, I would have to start actively leaving this place where I'm safe and the dreaming tree is safe and start invading the dreams of countless people from your world until I found somebody who knew you and was able to stay cognizant. It's a near impossible task. <sighs> One can see how you managed to let your followers down. <laughs> 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 and he kind of pulls back and um, the rest of you can kind of feel whatever sense of like humanity you kind of felt from him has, has kind of faded and it's kind of more of an emptiness now and he comes across much more like the entity who first descended the stairs and um, he stands up and he says well time is not our ally right now and he kind of points towards the door and the door is a just a simple tavern door and he says that's the only way out I trust you'll be able to find it and with that he walks away and starts ascending the stairs wait sulky little king isn't he isn't that another way wait. out there's stairs we can no, go hold on. as you say oh. that the stairs start to follow him oh, no. <laughs> heaven is. that's heaven but he thinks I, I, of everything <laughs> I I grab all my stuff up and I, I just say the sooner we begin the sooner we'll be able to get back to our normal lives I'm sorry and what's just... going on what what are we doing what's going on? <laughs> well, I, throw, I throw out my hands and I go whoa 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 Gen ladies gentlemen if we are about to risk our lives to fix this monarch's mistake surely we should know each other a little better I am Vasa a humble rogue of Rollum and the rest of you yes, have never fast. heard of this Rollum. Like that, I don't know, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, when you say that, Vasa, you're kind of saying it with a little bit of expectance. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like a, and you're welcome, right? <laughs> and, um, but so, you get nothing from the rest of them. <laughs> and I kind of like, I had a, like this kind of a flourishing bow, and then I, when I look up and I see the blank things on everybody's faces, I'm like, all right. Uh. <laughs> Is it a nice place, Rollum? Oh, it is beautiful, mysterious. It could steal your heart and your breath in a night. I'll have to ask Fenwick if he's been there. And who might you be, Grandmother? Oh, I, my name is Ertel B. Withers. Uh, I am from the nice little town of Phallus. Um... <laughs> And, of course, as I've already said, I am a grandmother. I have six children, Monty, Dana, Grover, Torrance, Coco, and Fenwick. And I have 22 grandchildren, Dewey, Bethany, Orchid, Neptune, Destine, Stuart, Key, Holly, Warren, Biloxi, Sandy, Erie, Elmore, Buckrow, Myrtle, Brady, Bradley, sorry, I hate his name, Harvey, Avalon, Martha, Crane, Tybee, and Monica. And they live all over, but they don't live in Rallum, which is why I was so interested <laughs> oh, to learn about that place. I'm Grumble Storm. This is Ro how do you say your name, Enzo? <laughs> Roberto. Roberto, let's just get going. <laughs> he heads towards the door. <laughs> I see here. You uh, you hear the chair just like scrape quickly. And you watch as the uh, dwarf kind of brumbles his way towards the door. I kind of look over to the female forged, and I kind of just go, and who might you be? And I kind of just, like, make this, like, motion, where I'm like, you know? <laughs> What is this? What is this going on? <laughs> I'm not here. Uh, I... <laughs> look back and I just am like I people call me Tin that's all I say <laughs> she seems very shy makes sense <laughs> but so sweet 
<laughs> for 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 stone and and metal, yes, yes, grandmother. <laughs> he has a soft inside. And uh, Tin and Ertleby, you recognize at least that you you, you get the, you you know that you're more familiar than the others. Of course. Yeah, and I've uh, seen her. Oh, <laughs> have you? No, I mean, I, the other uh, robots look the same to me. <laughs> That's racist. <laughs> She's old. <laughs> she called you robots. That's the... Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Grover works with the Forge often, so I have forged friends. Um, I kind of, um, I kind of just casually kind of look down at, um, at Erlby and at the, I'm kind of, I guess, referencing the object that is beneath her shawl, and I go, is that a herb smoking pipe, grandmother? Oh, no, it's my gun. I got it from a nice fellow named Benjamin Manley. Gun. Oh, yes. Oh, after Otto died, I needed something to fill the time. At least that's what Torrance said. So I decided to take up gunslinging. Uh, uh, her mentioning that, I I kind of perk up a little bit, and I'm, uh, I'm like, just... Just perk up a little bit. I don't say anything. I just, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> oh, it's so fun. Ethel, my friend, frenemy, she took up basket weaving, but gunslinging is so much more fun. I, I really have learned quite a bit from Mr. Manley. Well, grandmother, you are quite a specimen, and when you and I find some time, I have some herbs that we can gunsling together. That sounds <laughs> lovely, dear. <laughs> Nice. You remind me of young me. Oh, I didn't have hair like yours, though. Yours is much better. All right. Should we, should we go through that door over there? I suppose we shall, Grandmother. Elbow out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> little, 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 little. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed Worldwalkers. You can find us at www.worldwalkerspodcast.com, and you can also follow us on Twitter, at worldwalkerspod, and Facebook, at facebook.com slash worldwalkerspod. If you like what you've heard, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash worldwalkers. We've got some good stuff over there, and your support means I can devote more time to creating and publishing more episodes. I want to take a moment to thank our friends over at BattleBards for providing us with some of the audio you heard today. Take a moment to check them out over at BattleBards.com. They have everything from sound effects and NPC dialogue to beautiful music that will bring your tabletop game to the next level. I also want to thank Sirenscape for some of the audio you heard in today's episode as well. You can check them out at Sirenscape.com. Thank you again for listening to the first episode of World Walkers. We've been waiting a while to share this with everyone, and we hope you come back to hear what happens as the group moves forward on their search for the Shards of Stardust. <laughs> we'll take a second right now because we just lost Vasa. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, she woke up. <laughs> <laughs> She's out of the dream. Oh, oh no. <laughs> That's the difference between us and her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>